Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. Think of us as the love child of the National Review and Mad Magazine. We explain to you what the hell is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, share this episode with friends, and support us through PayPal or Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. We are supported by listeners like you, so $1 per episode by pledging $5 a month helps us grow. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. If you are new to the program, we catch up for the first 20 minutes or so, and then we deep dive into analyzing current events and society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned the language is strong and offensive sometimes. Uh, with me, as always, is my faithful co-host, Greg Lenz. Greg, how are you? You know, I, I, I would love to say I'm doing well, uh -huh. but I think you know me well enough to know that that would be a lie. Uh, I know. We're all a little bit tense today, it seems. Well, you know, when you guys just abandoned me, like I'm Stephen Glansberg <laughs> eating dessert alone at the lunch table, you know, that's what tends to happen. We didn't abandon you. You abandoned me. It <laughs> you, you, clear, you decided. There's a clear favorite now in the Wall family. We... We had to go, and you had to stay with Bittner, and I'm sorry. You know how you I got bit nerd. I got totally bit nerd, and you, my own co-host, did it to me. I know. And uh, with us as, as well is Cat and Agnos. Cat, how are you? Hello, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm, I'm sure doing you fine. Are. I'm sure you are. I'm fact, doing well. Both of you are doing well. I had a well, great day you? today. I'm yeah. sure you did. And I'm, I'm, that pleases me. I had pancakes for breakfast this morning. I had a great day at work. I ate a bag of Lay's potato chips, which I brought an extra one for you, buddy, because I know no, how you, much you like the greasy fingers. You brought fingers. one, and you took it back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is like that, what, what's that, White Christmas? Yep. Yeah, yeah. The white, the elephant. White, white elephant game. Yeah. That's what this is I like. Hey, I brought you a gift, and then... <laughs> and then wipes, wipes the oh, greasy fingers God. right on you. She, she did that the other day. She was like, can I borrow your <laughs> computer? <laughs> Someone complimented me on my shirt. Like, I've never seen that design with the handprints that just run down your back. I'm like, right. oh, well, we have a new co-host. And right. she's very socially adroit. Right, right. And then uh, Dear Leader provided me with sustenance in he the did. form of a Jimmy John sandwich. He did, which I'll be honest, I do love Jimmy John's more so than any other sub shop. I tried to pay for both of our meals, but he wouldn't have it because Dear Leader provides for me. The rumor on the street is that uh, Greg eats only Jimmy John's. Number nine, His with jalapeno days. chips. That's my go-to, three, probably three, four nights a week. So yeah. how many meals do you eat in a day? One. I do, I do coffee. I do a double, so it's called a black guy, mm. not a black guy. Right, right. <laughs> I don't. Thank you I don't order a hairy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do a, a black eye with cream, and then a black cherry limeade refresher, one of their like energy drink things. Mm -hmm. That's breakfast and lunch, and then I read the news at lunch every day. And then for dinner. And then Jimmy John's number nine. Like not all the time. Like I, I'm like particular, and like I, a lot of things bug me, mm -hmm. like digestive system wise. So that's kind of why. Oh, uh, okay. So you eat a Jimmy John sandwich every single night for dinner? No, 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 no. It's just like that would be my favorite. That's my go-to. What What do you eat if you're not eating? Do you ever cook? Oh yeah. What do you cook? Uh, usually like Italian. Really? Like spaghetti, cause it's easy. Don't mm -hmm. you get hungry in the daytime? No, like I, if I don't eat in the morning, I don't find I don't get hungry until like around six. Really? Uh huh. But if I if I do, I'm hungry like three times a day. See, I but I, then like digestive things kick up, so I, I can't mm. eat a ton for breakfast or a ton for lunch. Otherwise, I get sleepy. Yeah. Like it's like drinking. Like I don't really drink socially so much. Like I drink right. for purpose. Like I drink <laughs> to get drunk. I eat because I'm hungry. I don't like graze. I don't know how people like graze or like do things like in moderation. So what is the purpose of drinking tonight? Sitting next to it. Oh, got it. Got it. <laughs> Stress management. Understandable, understandable. <laughs> Everybody is, has their vices. I don't drink to make myself more tolerable. I drink to make others more tolerable. Yes. Very astute of you, I understand. I'm yeah. sure you do. Astute. Uh, is that the word? <laughs> Look at that. That's a, astute. Yeah. That's a solid 860 SAT word. Well done. Thank you, thank astute. you. Astute. Astute. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, uh, we will be off next week because we all just need a little break. <laughs> you know, like uh, there's a, we, uh, about once a week in the spring, the summer, the fall. and Quarterly. And, but every quarter, we just go. You know what? We need to wake a, a, a week. I away never from tire each other. of you. I've never tired of you. I, exactly. I never tire of you. Huh? I don't tire of any of you. It's our friends that I tire. No. I can understand that. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes Shocks you just need a vacation. I had to. Apparently, spend, though, it isn't mutual. It was your sister's birthday. <laughs> Not of an agnos in Happy the last twenty-four hours. Happy late one day birthday to my sister. It's cool. our twenty-fifth mid-year or halfway to fifty crisis. She was. Uh, she was well dressed. 
very. She was not in her Elkhart formal. What did her shirt say? It was very sorostituty. Namaste at the bar. That's what it was. Yes, right. I bowed the light in you at the bar. As we were going to the bathroom, um, this random girl was like, "Oh my!" She was like probably twelve drinks in. She's like, "Oh my god, well, what does your shirt say?" And my sister was like, "Well, it says na- Namaste at the bar. I I bought it like this." She's like, "Oh my god." That's freaking clever. I should have that for tomorrow when I go to my 9 a.m. yoga class. And it'll probably make my downward dog better. You know? My sister Someone was like, that hammered that early? Because oh, yeah. this was 7 o'clock. Like, this, yeah, the party yeah. started at 7. Yeah. Right. And it and wasn't it, really... We were like the only people party. in there, really. No, it was like a... De- uh, when people hear the word party, it was literally... Um, a, a libertarian party. A libertarian... No, It was but, 20 people awkwardly staring at their shoes, passively, aggressively, being mean to each other. And then communicating on Facebook. And then, right, and eating... Leaving early because someone, who shall go unnamed, Tim McGuire, kept annoying the, the only cool people at the party about, this, literally spent an hour talking to them about Dave Ramsey and their finances, and oh, oof, no. yeah, so, but, but yeah, uh, it was early. Yeah, a woman was trashed, but. I can't believe, I didn't see her. I wish I would have got to experience it was the so drunk, funny. that drunk girl at the bar before so 9, 9 p.m. Yeah, and then my sister hugged me, which she's never done before, so. That's Chloe is not a <laughs> hugger. No. You guys both have things about like the you know physical proximity. Right. Yours is Mine's dramatically a too, too much, close. Yes. And uh, hers is a little too. You too are. Uh, you do more way too much to make up for it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most like it was like two lobster calls. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the. Uh, it's like when uh, what's his face? Um, Bittner. No, what is his name? Oh my god! Oh, Ted Cruz in Carly Fiorina or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it was like he, a finger like, grab. She had this. He grabbed. <laughs> He was, yeah, like, covering her white power. <laughs> oh, man, that was bad. We're we're gesturing on the video. If you want to go to our YouTube channel, you can check out the... Oh, uh, I we're on right now. Yeah. Oh, I thought we were live streaming. No, no, no live stream today. Mm-hmm. We're just uh, we're, we're just recording this for YouTube. Uh, Given the, the anxiety-ridden state, I feel like the wrong comment might... Somebody might get holocausted. But the it, here's the thing. Uh, no, not you, a listener. Oh. Oh yeah, no. The the the, te- the tension rises, and you know you just need a break. And uh, you know I've I've been around people. Uh, I'm I'm like weirdly. Uh, I go up and like I'm very extroverted. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm an ENFJ in the Myers Briggs, and I love people, and I love my friends, and I love seeing them. But I need a significant amount of time by myself, and mm-hmm. I haven't gotten that. They say that's the one of the things about extroversion is that yeah. the more intense of the social settings, the more like intense the solitude you need to recover. Yeah. Well, the ENFP, which both Greg and I are, they are the most I introverted. Changed. Oh, you did. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah, they are the most introverted <laughs> of the extroverts. So they need sig- significant. Yeah, oh yeah. Time like I love I love people. Like I love parties Same. and everything. And then like at the same time, I could go and just like read for days. And on order end. your number seven at Jimmy John's. Nine. Oh, oh number Not nine. Not nightclub with peppers and then jalapeno, the chips. jalapeno chips. Yeah. Right. And then large diet coke. Mm. Yeah, like I, I have a week off, and so I'm going to spend the next. You know, you know, on uh, the Ju- July and these December breaks, I get uh, three weeks off a year, and I hibernate. I don't go anywhere. I just mm-hmm. stay in my apartment. I don't leave. And I don't talk to anybody. But in the summer, it's more it's more difficult because yeah. you're very much you're a fire person. Yes, right. You have a delightful uh, fireplace know, in my fireplace. luxury apartment, and you know, in it, I'm cat's doing something right now. I'm not sure what she's doing. Snapchatting for the followers to see that we're. Podcasting I just tonight. like I need a significant amount like uh, Re- r- recuperation. Right, like so we've we've gone hard and we've we've had several different parties and a lot of different parties over the last you know little bit, and I just need some time to myself. And uh, you just got to get like recalibrated. It, oh. it is. It's interesting to, to like you. You don't realize how important rest is until you get to like this kind of point where you're just like, if I don't get some rest, I'm going to tear the eyes out of everyone that I love. And I honestly don't know how like parents do it because there isn't mother like being a mother, especially it's like stay at home. mom. Yeah. Like, a, wow. Oh, I don't know how they do it because yeah. you're never alone. You never have that time to recharge your batteries. Like, that That to me would be super hard. There is no peace ever. Yeah. Well, you know? and, and I'm the type of person when even if we, like, if my family has gone on a vacation in the past, I, we're not the type to do the amusement park, the go, go, go every day. Touristy stuff? No way. We just, like, Chill. you go to Alabama a lot. We just sleep on the beach. Yeah. Right. Did you go to Gulf Shores? Yeah. yeah. Like, my grandpa had a That's house always, down there. Oh, did he really? Yeah. You just Wow. Oh, I bet he killed it. Because yeah. that place has exploded since, like, we've been going there for, like, 10 years. Oh, right. Yeah. No, it's great down there. But we're just the type of people, you know, my mom, like, we're, we all love to read. We just wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning, just go to the beach, and we're there until 6 o'clock at night, and then just, 
just veg. I don't want to see anybody. don't want to talk to anybody. So that's what I'm going to do this weekend, going home. And I'm just going to land the beach up northern Michigan. Or northern what beach? Indiana. The Indiana Dunes. So oh, yeah. No, those are, like, shockingly nice. Yeah. Ridiculously nice. I know. It's a hidden gem of the state. Like, people always laugh because Michigan beaches are usually considered better. But that's it's better. Yeah. No, it's it's great. So we will miss you all next week. Uh, I want to say hello to all of the new listeners. Uh, I checked the stats before we walked in here and we were at 9,999 downloads on that last episode on 216 and we've had like three or four thousand downloads just in the last few days to to, so 9,000 we it was kind of our peak on episode 204 and then all of a sudden we just started zooming and it it reached kind of a critical mass here in the last week and I contribute that to uh, my your appearance on Bad Christian on on the on the Bad Christian Network on uh, Break It Down with Matt Carter if you I didn't put it in the feed but you should go check out my interview with Matt Carter on Break It Down which is part of the Bad Christian Network which I love I've been a fan of them for about a year Uh, they do the Bad Christian Podcast is kind of like what we do. They're, um, they're three guys who sit around with their friends and talk about you know Christianity and, polit- and politics and life and morality and, and morality and society amongst each other, and it's, and it's a no-holds-barred look. They say uh, it's a Christian podcast where they say curses, and so they're very controversial over that. But I love those guys, and it was, like, it was really exciting. I've been talking to you guys for a couple of weeks. I'm like, if this happens, this is going to be awesome because I'm such a huge fan of the – those guys and apparently uh, we you know you were quite you did quite well in courting the bad christians i did oh i'm 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 i myself am a terrible christian i Um, wouldn't say that i wouldn't say that you (laughs) offered us you let us stray in (laughs) gave her food shelter (laughs) nourishment you know once you've sent once why not go the full nine yards it's exactly what i mean like murder lying if you're gonna do uh, abraham lincoln if you're whatever you are be a good one yeah (laughs) so so welcome to all of our new listeners we are libertarians and uh that means that we are uh we are about uh, about several things mostly non-intervention so we don't like government interfering in your personal life in the economic affairs of our our citizens or the world we don't believe in overseas wars unless it's a justified war. You know, libertarians don't believe in like going over and staying in Afghanistan for 20 years, but we do believe that if we're attacked, we should we should fight a war. Mm-hmm. Like in my opinion, World War II was a just war. World War One was not. Vietnam was not. Uh, you know, so the only thing in sight, you would probably say that World War II ended up creating the rest of the wars we've fought since. Absolutely, yeah. So there's unintended consequences, and a lot of what this show is about is the unintended consequences of policy. and uh, Beyond we, just what's on the you know surface of a discussion. Or absolutely. Issue. So we are irreverent. We are not your typical talk program. We're a group of about 20 friends here in Indianapolis that get together and talk about politics and and break it down as much as we possibly can. So I want to thank everybody. So to, to have, you know, 3,000 new listeners in less than a week is pretty exciting for us, and we want to welcome yeah. you guys and hope that you guys will stay. And if you like it, please share the podcast. Um, I know that last night at Chloe's dinner I sat next to a new listener to the podcast, Lauren. Yeah. Um, she, because of because of cat coming on the program uh she started checking out the podcast and said she really enjoyed it good yeah, yeah which which was cool because i you know because my sisters and kyle are so much older is that all of their friends i knew going in because i was a freshman in college when chloe graduated so i didn't really know any of her friends that well but with lauren who's the new listener she just was like oh i love the podcast by the way which was really awesome that it wasn't like you know <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, there's currently. also a cat named mitten and interfere with the podcast. She's our Hitler. Yeah. Right. Mittler. But, <laughs> Mittler. Yeah, but it's just cool that, you know, it's not our, it's not our best friends or our friends who right. are listening Right, the anymore. people who would, even if you did the worst podcast imaginable. Exactly. We're actually starting to. Those people actually don't listen. <laughs> yeah, they don't. No, listen. unless they're on. Yeah. Unless they're on. Like or, or, uh, or they'll listen to the segment where they're brought up. Right. Exactly. My, sorry, sorry. See, we're trying to be professional but we've got a cat that destroys the the podcast all the time. One thing you'll learn about dear leader yes. Chris Spangle is that he has the most unruly pussy you'll ever <laughs> see. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, very very good. I uh, we we are coming off of a stunning defeat. Oh. Last weekend was I can't even talk about it. Was a kick in the nuts. Wait, we've re- we've recorded since then. No, we, we have not. We no, no, we haven't. We um we were up for an award. 
We were up at, at PopCon. For the big one. For comedy and for... Um, news. For news. And we lost. And, and then for- podcast... Greatest mm-hmm. podcast in the history of ever created podcasts. Just a, a podcast that, you know, is is probably going to peak at 12, 13,000 listeners here in the next couple weeks. Ten feet higher. Lost to a podcast in comedy that had seven episodes. <laughs> and and then uh, congratulations to them. We're not, we're not, I listen, I'm a bad sport. Greg is not. I don't know about Kat. She's yeah, a- I was pissed. I'm not going to lie. Were you here's, really? Here's the thing. We When we all lost, we graciously clapped, and we didn't really think anything of it because in reality, I the, the competition was held in the basement of this convention, and there were three <laughs> people in the audience, and the the awards and Very quotes, low energy pod- low energy. podcast the awards. The awards were like freaking cardboard paper in a Walmart frame. Like, it wasn't anything big, but however, we pretended to be outraged for the bit. And then about 30 minutes into being outraged, I turned to Spangle and I was actually really upset we lost. I threw a chair. Yeah. Honestly. You tried. I tried. You well, tried. they it were was, bolted down. It was bolted. Because they knew. They knew we were going to be there. Yeah. Even I, thank Bobby Knight. Yeah. We, but, and we yeah. lost to a grandchild of our in, ours in news. We lost can't talk about this. to an atheist podcast. Secular. It, well, uh, okay, the secular perspective, it, it is a spinoff of a podcast that Greg and I helped start called The Obsessive Viewer. I was actually the first host of The Obsessive Viewer, and I do, we actually do, with their hosts, um, a, a uh, it, local movie uh, movie and film producers horror festival each year. Right. This is going to be the fourth year. And I was the first host of the first episode of Obsessive Viewer, and then didn't get invited back for a year, then did it, came on again, and then... I'm still waiting on that third invite. <laughs> right. You know, and so then uh, they've actually done extremely well. Matt Hurt is, I mean, every, every bit as passionate about libertarianism as you and I are and Kat. Right. And like the people in our universe, he is that obsessive about movies, film, books. TV, I mean, yeah. the guy is encyclopedic and just a r- exceptionally br- brilliant guy, really, to be honest. Um, but so Matt has really grown it into a, a brand and done extremely well. But a guy that was kind of a fringe friend ended up, uh, or his co-host, Tiny Anthony Ramian, he started this thing called The Secular Perspective. He wanted to get around to do what we do with a round table and discuss uh, religious religious issues, but from a secular perspective, rather than like how we do news and current events from a libertarian perspective. And then he, you know, got engaged and you know how the effect women have on podcasting. Yep. You end up slowly but surely not seeing them anymore and they just don't have time because it's been booked by others. Um, Sorry, were you talking about me? No. Uh, No. Oh, carry on. No, no, no. I'm talking about all of my buddies that like they start these wonderful projects with all this potential and then they fall in love and then they lose all ambition and just Mm. it becomes like kid parties and loafers. Can't imagine what that's like, Greg. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Did you just touch him again? I caressed his face. I have the weird thing about being touched. <laughs> yep, I know. Caressed, really. It's not so much touching as it's very, you lingered. Yeah. And that's right. awkward. <laughs> yeah. Hey. I'm kidding. I thought it was great. <laughs> it's fine. I brought you My a bag of My beard was chips. slightly, you know. Uh, Greg. <laughs> you can eat them. I'm oh, happy. I know. I'll I, I, I know what's really going on here. But so then, uh, yeah, and so then we lost because Chad took it over from Tiny because Tiny quit. And then Chad kind of rode the coattails to the success and won the award and beat us. And you made it clear you weren't pleased. (laughs) I'm not happy about it. You know, Kat, you said what? Um, Like I said, at first it was a joke, and then I got pretty angry. Oh, my horrible joke that I said. Right. Right. Well, we were so, so upset. And then, you know, after all of our pouting and booing and mean tweeting and then Spangle, or I'm sorry, Dear Leader, tried to throw the chair, but we found out it was bolted to the ground. I just said, you know, it's all right. Let the Atheist Podcast have this award because they're going to hell anyway. So. I mean, their treasures are here on earth and ours are in heaven. Right. As Methodists, three of us are Methodists. Exactly. We'll be on the right side of the pearly gates laughing and judging at That's them. That's right. And we will get our own awards. <laughs> Damn right. So congrats. Eternal salvation. I mean, really, exactly. <laughs> our grandchild won the award, so we really can claim victory. Exactly. And no, 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 no. Greg and I can claim victory. Hey, hey, for the record, that's fair. That's a fair <laughs> point. What's that happened to weird libertarians is you've heard of the Spanish Inquisition. Right. This is the Greek Inquisition. Re- yes, exactly. exactly. The Greek invasion. <laughs> yeah. You give Germany that money back, and then you can talk. <laughs> exactly. No, no. But yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you did that, because that's something we've not been particularly strong at, is cross-promoting through non-political uh, podcast. you know, other podcasts. Right. And... 
we've kind of just recruited in house within our little libertarian yeah. silo, and so it's. I'm so glad that, you know you're the kind of individual worthy of invitations on things such as the Bad Christian well, podcast. Well, I'm frankly amazed as well, and I thought it went really well. He enjoyed it, and so uh, I'm looking said, forward to I know going this back guy. On. He's a terrible Christian. I think he's perfect, <laughs> and uh, this would really be great. Yeah. But thank you all for uh, giving us a try. Yeah, so we appreciate yes. it, and so we, we, we lost one to the atheists this week, but uh, we, we, gained, we gained some new listeners, so we appreciate that. And we do thank PopCon. We, we ended up having a great time. And it, like, if you're, yeah, it's so fun. If you're in the Midwest, like, go to PopCon. It's a, it's a blast. And Everyone is so friendly and outgoing and yeah. nice. It's amazing. It's one of the best. It's like a pop culture c- convention, and it's sort of like, it, it's not like Comic-Con. I mean, it's a little more everything, so it's really a fun time. Yeah, they had video game stuff, like Harry Potter. The entire Potter. game zone set up in a room, which was really, yeah. like, yeah. if you're into gaming, which I know you are, like, it's that would be in heaven, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. It was just a very cool place to be. So what we want to talk about this week is anti-intellectualism because I think we're hit, starting to hit a peak. And I, this is something, uh, you know, there's a lot in the news and you have the Donald Jr. stuff and we'll, we'll maybe touch on that here at the end. But this is a trend that I think is really starting to take off and that is getting rid of expertise and saying, you know what, the experts aren't the experts. Intellectuals don't know what they're talking about. So we want to break some of that down and, and have a conversation about anti-intellectualism, uh, you know, which hopefully you, uh, as in this follow-up episode, find, find interesting. But uh, I think you will. And it's important to frame it right. It, it, you know, much of this out, like, it's, it's sort of hit a critical mass, like we've right. been talking about. Like, this Pew did a, recently conducted a survey, and for the first time, the majority of Republicans thought attending college was a bad idea. Right. Mm-hmm. And that... You know, that created the immediate backlash on Salon, Daily Kos, uh, The Atlantic, all of them saying, and Salon was, was the article that was published with um, the headline, Have We Hit Peak Anti-Intellectualism? Right. And that is just at the point where is higher education actually considered like the fifth estate or, mm-hmm. you know, like the manipulative tool of government um, rather than a, something to be pursued and to aspire to, mm-hmm. you know, it's become even education has become politicized. Right. right. You know, we're like this is the most politic. Everything's politicized at that point. Right. For if sure. learning's politicized, whoa. Yeah. So how do we let's define anti-intellectualism? Let's start at the very beginning, and the definition is opposing or hostile to intellectuals or to an intellectual view or approach. And kind of break that down a little bit. Expand on that, Greg. I think it's important. Yeah, like getting it set properly is really important because a lot of people would read, would hear us say peak anti-intellectualism and immediately think, oh, you're, we're just, you're anti-knowledge. You'd rather keep right. people ignorant and that way you can control them and manipulate them. Right. And that isn't at all personally how I would feel. Mm-hmm. I mean, I am someone that thinks that, you know, highly, highly value education Absolutely. and think that, you know, education should never stop once a degree is awarded. Both of your parents are professors, right? Yeah. Yeah. Your You're... mom, yeah, my dad, lifelong professor. Oh, yeah. Your mom is. Yep. My mom is. Yeah. And she educates me daily on Facebook. Oh, yeah. She's literally right now educating us on, on messages. <laughs> oh. So sliding oh. in DMs. Yeah. She's in our DMs. <laughs> no. But um, so what it really is, is there's been. There's been a slow, I mean, it, actually, it's just societal decay in general in institutions. And right. even institutions as far as, like, public intellectuals, the people you see that are on the nightly panels on CNN, the experts they bring in to provide uh, commentary, analysis, and information, mm-hmm. they have slowly but surely become seen as partisan mm-hmm. hacks. And so much of science and much of, um, actually, primarily the social sciences are where most of the politics. Uh, politicization has happened, but then also you're seeing it with the rise of things like inconvenient truth Mm -hmm. and Al Gore and climate change is another area where the politics has really dominated the hard science, the facts, the analysis, because there have there's been a lot of conflicting information about how the models have been assembled, how the predictions have turned out. And so it's just a peak anti-intellectualism is being by the left positioned as anti-knowledge and by the right as, well, this isn't anything more than um, thought control. And y'all deserve it a little bit. I mean, the, like that... The, You're, the you've right... been wrong. Look at everything you've said. Here's your track record. Right. Explain. Mm-hmm. We, we, and, I, and I always kind of marvel at people, well, we need regular people to do things. It's like as, as if somebody who has a college uh, master's or PhD, somehow not a regular person. Well, that's... In the United States, I've always said, that, you know, 
there isn't a national religion other than higher education. Education is our like be all end all right. cure, and yet it hasn't panned out. Like you end up with um, credential inflation, where you baristas with masters, mm-hmm. you know, it, it doesn't work like it used to. It's sure. not. It doesn't help you climb up that uh, the social mobility ladder. Right. And so it's inevitable. All these circumstances coming together, you're going to get a backlash, especially if you've been wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. When you're disproven, that's the you know. That's the thing that sucks about putting yourself out there is if you're wrong, it's hard to recover. Right. Like, how do you guys feel about it? Well, I think that, uh, that people are experts for a reason and people that dedicate their lives to a craft, people that dedicate themselves to learning and studying a, a subject or a process are experts for a reason and they should be listened to. I mean, even politicians. I, I, I'm not anti-politician for the most part. I, I think that... Politicians, by and large, have been pigeonholed by the public, and they have no balls, and that's the problem. But you look at uh, people who run campaigns, people who practice the art of political science, which I think it's an art, not a science necessarily. I think it's really tough. Like, the social sciences really shouldn't be called that. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think that's a terrible thing to call them because I just don't think that's remotely correct. Sure. So you have something like political science or you have something like a football team, for Mm -hmm. instance. Let's apply it to sports because this may be easier for people to understand. Like, I don't know anything about football. I don't know anything about sports. But I feel that my opinion is as valid as Chuck Pagano's in the Indianapolis Colts. He's the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. Why is my opinion as equal to Chuck Pagano and the GMs and the and the owners? Why are we equal? We're not. And and yet the fans feel this sense of ownership over the decisions that the team makes and they don't understand the different levers that they have the ability to pull and the buttons that they have to push to make a team work like an NFL team. You've got all kinds of different personnel choices, salary choices, strategies strategies that go into things. And so when things are announced and decisions are made on a football team, everybody loses their mind and they said, well, they should have done this. They should have drafted this guy. But that guy may not have been available or may not fit the long-term strategy. And we are applying that kind of thinking to politics, to business, to society, to religion, to everything. And throwing out any kind of belief in what experts have to say or experienced people have to say in favor of just our own gut. And just because we have an opinion on something, it doesn't mean that our opinion is equal to somebody who is like the head of an NFL coach. For right. Instance. How do you feel about that cat? Do you have any particular way you, does it bug you at all? Like there's some um, ever the last, actually this last year, the election I felt like was this, all culminated and everyone was an expert all the time on the entire presidential election. Oh, for sure. And I think that, um, you know, like we were talking about for college campuses, especially is everyone like education is being politicized. Right. And it's true because like I said, I've had friends who on the day of day after the election night or whatever came to my dorm and were like, Oh my gosh, my teacher just, my professor, college professor started bawling in the middle of class because of how, because of the outcome of the election, you know, and we had, wow, pr- yeah, and this wasn't made up. And we had professors who um, were professors of the social sciences, I'm assuming, right? Sociology, political um, science, political science, history, history anthropology, um, uh, linguistics, social work. So, oh, yes. Well, well, that's is that a social is science? being nice to bums a major? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> my mom's a social worker. I tell oh, her so that. does a joke all the time. I was about to say, don't let my roommates hear like, that. Mom, how is that graduate course in being nice to poor people? Oh, no. <laughs> but um, what was I going to say? Yeah. So, the you know, these highly intelligent, highly educated college professors at a state school, um, you know, were crying in the middle of class and were just I am so worried because of how you kids are gonna turn out because of Donald Trump. You know ah. what I mean? And just they let all literally shaking. Yeah, literally shaking. And they let you know students out early to go have anti-Trump protests on the quad, which like a four, national hug day. Four people went to. Oh yeah, there were free hugs being offered. Um, they sent out mass emails to all the students 
uh, and this isn't like some small, this is a state school. Yeah. They, they sent out Ball mass. State's a very large yeah. university. What is it, like 25,000, yeah, 40,000 so. undergrads, somewhere near? And they, they sent out emails saying if any of us need to talk, the counseling center will be open even more. Um, Are no, you kidding? I'm not even exaggerating. This is 100% true. You got like a university email that yeah. said if you need counseling services, yeah. it'll I'll be pull available it up after because the show of the election. And show you. It was ridiculous. So it's just, you oh know, these highly educated people who are our, they're in charge of not even just the normal level of education that is the American standard. They are the higher education, you know, market. And they're just being politicized is ridiculous. Yeah. And right? so you, so do you feel like that it's, you feel like your educational experience, like within the liberal arts specifically, is already politicized? Like it's For so sure. biased in one way, it's impossible to not or to get the the opposing arguments? For sure. And any completely. attempt to try and bring it back the other way is just resisted as tyranny. Exactly. Was well, it's rejecting intelligence? Exactly. And you can't, you know, because I was a, a journalism student. I guess I kind of still technically am. But and you're getting ready to be a junior. So, like, yeah. you're still knocking it, you know, you're still figuring out exactly what you want to concentrate in. Exactly. So, I guess I, I'm still in the college. But, but you've been exposed to them all. Right. So, that's basically where, where we're at. But, like, you know, they just teach us, um, no, we are in charge of finding heartbreaking news and you can't be biased. So you can't listen to Fox News or, you know, they did throw in don't listen to MSNBC. You have to listen to CNN, which, as we all know, it's fake news. Right. Based off I of our discussion. Is, I know. Trump they, tackled CNN. So it's fake. It's yeah. Fake. But, um, <laughs> you know, you can't speak out about that. And I remember the day after election, um, one of my news professors, we all came into the class and she was like, I just really want everyone to know, like, it's going to be okay. Like, it's D- going to be okay. And I'm just sitting there like, but, like I said, I'm a pretty outspoken person, but you can't, especially on a college campus, you, and especially in one of the most liberal uh, majors there is, you know? It, would you say journalism is predominantly liberal? For sure. The students? For sure. I only know of two students who were Republican. Confirmed wow. in yeah. the closet. Who they had, uh, <laughs> yeah, they went to the... Um, What's it called? CPAC? Yeah. Yeah, CPAC. Yeah, two students went and they had stickers on their laptop. Only two that I know of who were in class with me. The but, brown shirts. Right. No, there there's a few other Republicans who are in uh, the CCIM department, but for the most Interesting. part, very, very liberal. Because if you think about it, it's a mirror because they see their, you know, um, role models like Rachel Maddow and all these kind of people want to be like that. The media is so left and liberal and whatnot of course well it's, it's the that's the quick way to you know that's the fastest way to get your ticket punch is to be a part of that exactly. that camaraderie and that um viewpoint like you exactly. know you, you get invited to the cocktail parties and mm-hmm. you know you're groomed and then they own you though because you're never allowed to break rank exactly and that's exactly just how um they get in and so i only had one professor she was a journalism professor who was independent and she got shit on by all the students during the election. This was my freshman year, so it was before. So 2015, hmm. 2016, yeah. before the election. Wow. But And you could tell that she was really a, did an excellent job of making sure you couldn't really tell what her political positions were? She was teaching more of the history of journalism. Okay. So it wasn't... She wasn't a political type of... Uh, no. Stu- course of study. No, but it was... Um, she was independent. She made a few comments. I don't remember what they were about. Oh, I don't like Hillary Clinton at all. I don't like Donald Trump. And people were like, well, how... How can you think that, you know, and it's just like, oh, my God, um, I was a because I was a poli sci minor. I or, Yeah. And I had one professor. My first he was a libertarian. The best guy. Oh, you had uh, the economist. Uh, no, I know who you're talking oh, there was about. Cecil Cecil Bohannon. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, OK. No. So he even told you he was libertarian. It was just a new guy. Yeah. Uh-huh. It wasn't Dr. Horowitz, was it? Steve Horowitz? No. Well, where you're going to school, they have the, uh, what's the... Liberty, the, it's a the, Liberty the, Economic Think Tank. Yeah. An institute. Oh, for, I don't know anything about principles. it. The Shat- yeah, so I Steve don't know Horowitz opened it. it. Shat- Dr. Horowitz. The Shatner Institute. His name is... Yeah. Um, Horowitz? Literally, no. Oh. I can't think of the name of the... He was brand new. Oh, the one you had. That yeah, from uh, New Jersey and, or something. And did he identify as libertarian, or yeah. did you put it together? He said he was libertarian. Yeah. He was... Interesting. The, and he did the best job of just talking good and bad of both sides. Well, that, I mean, that's the nice Incredible. thing about like this show too, is being libertarian frees you to analyze both sides. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's the ideal for a, polit- you know, any type of liberal arts class that's studying politics mm-hmm. or any type of like public policy. Yeah. And I took one religious science class, um, that I had to take for my like religious degree. science or religious studies. Okay, cool. Yeah. It was mortality. I was like, and that'd be interesting. Death and defying. Yeah. That's what it was. And, 
the professor was nobody knew what her religion was the entire time because she was so good at You know they're usually atheists. You know in religious studies departments. Really? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's really? actually yeah how um, a lot of the time they're atheists. They just study it as like it's history. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. So that way they can be objective about it. That's actually it's pretty cool because everybody the whole class is and it was like the rumor of the department was oh nobody knows who professor blank is like what her thing is because she speaks so much about Christi christianity and then she talks about the you know they have the whole unit about islam and talked about like hinduism and buddhism and she was so she knew everything and she never gave any hint not even the slightest that's huh i mean I, that's so that, one means she did a really good job but that's usually the that's one of the biggest criticisms of conservatives in liberal arts courses when it's religion based is um that they they are atheists teaching about something they don't, something they don't know, mm -hmm. or something that wow. they've chosen to mm. reject. And like that, the book "God and Man at Yale" that started William F. Buckley's career was a criticism of his his Yale experience. Really, and it was hugely incendiary because that was his critique of the religious, the divinity school, mm -hmm. was that it, the entire divinity school's department were atheists, and the entire economics department were all Keynesian collectivists, and yet all of them were told. Go be individuals, go West young man, be industrious entrepreneurs and leaders, and yet everything they learned right. was either from atheists or collectivists. Socialists, yeah. And then wondered why the kids they were turning out were so different than what the intention of the university was and all the alumni were donating to. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it was a very interesting class. It was about, like, uh, what was it? It was religion, mortality, and death, which sounds mm, that'd be something... Good. But it was all about, we learned all about, you know, uh, physicians assisted suicide and the um, the death with dignity law, the same thing. And we talked all about, like, that kind of stuff. And it interesting. was really interesting. The morality of assisted suicide. Yeah. It was such an interesting class. I'm all for it. I wish more people would invoke it. Yeah. So would you yeah. say would you say the the rise in anti intellectualism really comes from people feeling that higher learning, especially which is intellectuals work at what places? Where do they draw paychecks generally? Yeah, the academy. Colleges, universities. Uh, public intellectuals in the media. Think tanks. They almost all come out of like these same – they all come out of the university. They make their name there, and they make some contribution that's seen as extremely right. relevant, and then they leverage that into public intellectualism. Exactly right. And a lot of it comes from, uh, I think a lot of the anger comes from a leftist point of view and a retaliation against that. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's what I don't like about the way the conversation's framed is um, most of it is framed as whatever it is the academy has decided is true, even if it's consensus and dissenting opinions exist, Anything other than the exi what the consensus orthodoxy is 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 heresy and anti intellectual. You're against, um, you know, they have a monopoly monopoly on what is science and what is not, right. what is knowledge and what is not, and that couldn't be further from the case because the only the only gains you make in knowledge are by challenging the existing status mm -hmm. quo. Once it, the danger is you have a monopoly only on ignorance because you won't allow it to be challenged. It's the same as growing muscle. Unless you're pushing your muscle and tearing muscle, you're not going to grow muscle. Exactly. You know, it's and the only way to really test whether something's true or not is to see if it's false. And I kind of see, because, you know, we were talking about how, oh, where's this? Is it? Is it yeah, so the, for the first time, a majority of Republicans think that colleges and universities have a negative impact on the country. 58% uh, think that. Um, and I can completely see that because if you think about it, a lot of Republicans, you know, they, there's the stereotype that Republicans are rich white people. Yeah, there's which, country club Republicans and Trump Republicans. Exactly. Right. And, yeah, the reality TV Republicans. Right. And Republicans generally, I'm assuming, have more money than Democrats do. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because it's an older party. Exactly. Yeah, they've had longer time to acquire assets. So, you know, you can kind of go off that. OK, that because that's pretty much true. Um, more Republican, more children from Republican families probably go to college. That actually, I don't think it. I, I don't no. know. I don't want to say, but I, you know, there's a lot. It's it's not in vogue to be Republican. Like you didn't even want to identify before you became a libertarian, like, you know, kind of really got exposed to it. Right. But like you were afraid to admit it. Right. But like people who come from a f that family oh, so republicans yeah. because they have more money they tend to send their kids to college more yeah you would think so yeah absolutely would I would, that absolutely is true okay so that kind of makes sense that they think that colleges and universities have a negative impact because 
their kids go and then they become Bernie Bros. And right. They start taking part in all Rebel. these protests and they're rebelling and they come home and they've got all these tattoos, which there's nothing wrong with, but that could just I'm going, you know, they got the they stopped they stopped, you know, identifying by a particular gender. Right, exactly. They want <laughs> one scoop of ice cream and think that's all everybody should get. Exactly. But but you know <laughs> what I mean? Two. No. Not two scoops. Not two I know, scoops, just one. the one. But you know what I mean? Like they these people who come from Republican families go to college and they're exposed and they become Bernie bros and then they go home and their parents are like, what are you guys doing? And I really want to work on my art. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so that's my why podcast. I'm, <laughs> you know, and, uh, <laughs> right. But we're the cool ones. But, and that's, I think is why, um, these families and Republicans are now more than ever. They think that college is, is a waste of time. Yeah. It, it's, it's counterproductive to what they want their child to learn because now more than ever, college professors are extremely liberal and things on college campuses are so liberal. That's the thing is where else can you study? Where else can you go study the social sciences and earn a living? Mm -hmm. Like economics, you can do it as like a wall street forecaster or you could do it as like, you know, owning a hedge fund or something like that or investments, personal finance. But mm -hmm. outside of that, trying to go and say, yeah, well, I'm an expert in cultural patterns and sociology or, you know, anthropology or linguistics it's really tough to like go get a job in that area, um, that actual focus in the private market. Mm -hmm. And so it's natural that since that the reason universities exist is to employ those individuals, give them a place to go and work on them and advance, you know, the furthering of knowledge in those, uh, those disciplines. Right. Because they are important. It's just they don't necessarily, people don't see the economic value of them in the free market. Right. And I, and yeah, and I think now more than ever, college, campuses are political more political and uh, i think that i think goes, that all of society after trump post-trump world is more political than i've ever seen way more political and of course that's changing you know influencing these young kids who are on their own for the young adults who are on their own for the first time and absolutely that's what's causing this 58 percent think that college yeah that's is a, that's a, a stunning impact. number because my parents believe it and my parents are they think college. your college is actually detrimental to your development oh yeah and they it goes both way but and now more than ever, they think that for Do sure. Do you feel it is? Um, yeah, and I think my sister would agree too. Really? Yeah. Here's the thing, and it's not anything against the school that I go to. It's just the way that the system is because all of my friends at other schools agree. It's that I feel as if I could drop out now and be okay in the sense of because I feel like for, for the most part, unless you're studying to become you know, a nurse or a doctor or an engineer or Something like that. The hard sciences. The hard, ones, yeah. hard scientists that will always be around. Facts. Facts, right? I feel like there's no point. Like for me personally with, you know, the whole department, there's no point in me sitting in a, in a classroom, you know, having, getting, a lot of times you're not taught, you're preached to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, clearly there need to be a, there needs to be like a Copernican shift in the right. way education is delivered. And the thing is, if you think about it, those who can't do teach. Yeah. For, for a lot of people, those who can't do teach. Yeah. And there is a difference in, you know, a lot of great businessmen are, would be terrible in a classroom. Right. You know, like Donald Trump clearly knew how to, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, no matter what you say about him, he knew how to take a last name and turn it into a luxury lifestyle brand like no one's ever done. Right. All the way to the White House. So clearly, but I doubt he would be able to put that into... To be able to look at that from like a 10,000 feet vi view, mm -hmm. break it down into like where the inflection points were and what the, you know, take the lessons away from it, put that into a curriculum and right. deliver it to a court, to a class. Right. Exactly. And, and that's so the real difference, you know, between the, dis the experts in the discipline and the experts in observing the discipline and explaining why they were successful. Right. Right. And I just think personally that me sitting in a classroom getting preached to on ideals that I don't necessarily agree to. Sure, some college classes I've been in have been great, but a lot of them are a waste of time. My mind's wandering. I could be doing something else. I could yeah. actually be learning the skills. It's the disconnect is enormous in Such a the, disconnect. the short like the short attention span of society and like the, you can you could really I'm sure in an, what is it 45 minutes to an hour your normal length of your actual lectures? Yeah. 
I'm sure that you could get it all in a 15 minute video with an expert and get way more out of it than, and then ha then you explain, you know, really the best way to learn is to teach. So well, that's, I mean, that, teach it. that's part of the reason that we do the podcast right. so we can learn about this stuff and then teach it to others. It forces us to go out and, and research and find new things. You know, we love learning. Like we're so pro education. Right. Exactly. Well, and here's the thing is and with cat. I mean, I've, I, I mean, I've said like opportunities knocking, like why stay in school? You know what I mean? When when a lot of what you have learned in school didn't really apply for the internship that you just had. Right. And it's one of those things where I've always kind of, and I've had this discussion before, I've always felt really stupid compared to my peers because they enjoy sitting in the classroom and taking notes and making flashcards and studying and getting good grades on tests. I'm more of the, I need hands-on experiences. I need to Learn go, by doing. Learn by doing. And... I just feel like it's a waste of time for me to sit in a classroom. Oh, yeah. Now, the, the classes that I've had where I've gone out and actually held the microphone and done the video editing stuff myself right. have been great, and I still use that every day. Yeah, like the practical skill courses. Practical skills, and I feel like we're just so far away from that, you know? Oh, I, yeah. I mean, most of it's just like a rote memorization assembly line model. Exactly. And, like, the social sciences haven't abandoned that. Like, they still think that they're in the Lyceum and, you know, Plato's giving... <laughs> divine knowledge to a group right. of observers. And of course there are some things, you know, like nursing students uh, have to memorize terms. Right? Absolutely. And for, you know... Um, That's like the standard operating yeah. you know, knowledge you need to be able to, you know, draw blood. Right. And I'm not saying that the traditional college experience is bad. I just think that it's way more... Um, it's way less practical than it should be. Do you enjoy it? Um, I don't know. Honestly... And here, here's what I think, and my sister would agree. The best thing that college will do for somebody is help them mature, help them learn how to live on their own, help them learn how to deal with people in real situations. The in socialization. Real time. Yeah. And if you go to a good school, have uh, good connections and whatnot. For me, it was about learning to think critically, expanding outside of the, just the rote memorization. And do you think you did, though, kind of before? Because like you were um, already doing things like writing a column in high school. Yeah, but and you were already a big reader. It, it gave me more of a framework in which to operate with. Gave me more tools on how to do that stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and exposed it, you to better it, ways of thinking or approaching it. Yeah, it gave me the connections then to start a career. Mm -hmm. That's actually yeah, because well, you were a history major at IUPUI, right? I was, yeah. And then how did how did the connection with Abdul pop up to do radio? So I was listening to a talk station, and they would play the Indians games, and it would get in the way of me listening to Michael Savage at night when I delivered pizzas. And I wrote a very stern email to the program director, and he said, "Ah, oh, I used to deliver pizzas. What do you, you know?" And we got to talking via email, and um, then he said, "Yeah, if you ever want an internship, let me know." So I went to school, set it up. Got an internship, started there, and I was there for four years. So, so really, it was your own personal interest that got you the actual opportunity. You just formalized it into an internship I, through I, the school. It's very much like what happened with Kat here, mm -hmm. where you know I was. You left out milk, and she stayed. So, right. Sophomore, <laughs> sophomore into junior year, I got an internship with a radio station. I went and did that and realized that most of what I was learning in school was not applicable to what I was doing, and I absolutely bombed that next semester. And then I uh, just stopped going. I just stopped registering for classes. I dropped out and I started working. You know, it it just didn't seem to me to be a beneficial time. Uh, it was a time waster. Yeah, and especially in media too. If that's your, right, yeah, media is so different than any other medium. I tell kids all the time, like industry. You know, if it's if it's uh, the case where Cat feels like she needs the next two years to go and learn more skills and needs more time to mature and needs to do you know certain things that she should do it because the realities are that you have to start making money and you have to start working for jobs immediately you right. know and you got to be prepared to do that you got to make rent you got to pay bills you got to do all that stuff but the when you could just take two years and spend time goofing off and learning how to edit video and doing all that stuff but don't expect that piece of paper to get you anything. A lot of times it will get you your first job and then it will never be considered again. Exactly mm -hmm. right. But, you know, it, it, in my case... Like you earned it your, the hard way. It, it, Most it, people can't tough it, don't want tough it out and do no, it. No, and, and not having a degree was very uh, stressful on me for, for a long time. And, you know, people still encourage me to go back to school. And I'm like, why would I go back to school? Like, I have absolutely no reason to go back to school. That piece of paper means nothing. I'm a, I'm a polemoth. Uh, I learn on my own. I, 
I just don't need that credential. It, I don't need the credential or the the rigor of that structure, you know, because I've built my own structure uh, to to become a lifelong learner to to continue to improve myself and build skills. I just don't need it. Like right. it, it's it's nothing about my self esteem, and I feel that a lot of people, and I'm fortunate in that I did that because I was in the workforce three years earlier than my peers who all left college at the time that the economy collapsed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they gambled by staying and getting a piece of paper when I started working and hustling, and I got, I got, uh, I'm much further ahead of my career than most of my friends. Who Especially played. in this particular industry, right. like, which is the hardest one to rise quickly because a yep. credential does nothing to enhance your value. Literally, no, like, where the last three jobs I've worked, nobody asked if I had a college degree. My bosses do not know if I have a college degree or not. They don't care. And most of the time, they Literally don't even ask. They, they ask for years of attendance. So if you went four years, right. it looks, it's indistinguishable exactly. whether or not you graduated. Right. So I have 120 credit, 28 credit hours. Or You're six, over then. Or I'm 68 credit hours or something. I'm halfway there. But, like, it, it just did, like, to me, going and taking two, Four semesters of Spanish, when I don't ever intend to use Spanish, it doesn't make sense to me. You yeah. know why? Why go and spend that money? And I think that part of the reason that people have kind of this this anger towards is they're looking back. You know, as early as a sophomore, junior in college, you know, all the way up to baby boomers are sitting here going, "My college was really worthless, and I now have a student loan debt of ten to a hundred thousand dollars for something that really didn't matter right you know and so that creates to your career to your professional career your I, social like your so right. the social circles and like the experiences lifelong friendships that kind of thing right, is right. The value and, is. and that's where it's kind of different is because like in high school i thought high school was a complete waste of time skill wise looking back the only thing that i use every single day is the digital media classes that I took all four years, both semesters, or yeah, both semesters, and I got to like digital media class eight, which there was three people in my class, and it was I learned all about video editing and cameras and lighting. Now and you did like learn et like grammar and you know proper English okay, and how yeah. to write and like those kind of things. Yeah, like you know things you Elementary have to know. School is is but then you know beneficial. you enhance them and bring them right. up. Yeah, right. But then like as far as and then you're also like you you know about things you're, you're you know you're not true. a flat earther because you took science class true true right so the, yeah but it's hard to justify it. like in hindsight you're like did those really change anything no but i'm glad i'm aware of them exactly and it's you know i'm 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 glad that i have friends and at the same time well mm. verdict's still out on strong, that one strong strong word um but i'm i'm glad i've you know had those opportunities and i have because you know i played high school soccer i know what it's like to go through x y and z and i know what it's like to be um dedicated for for orchestra and being in, in the school newspaper or whatever you know what i mean so that those things were great but honestly i've gotten the most out of extracurricular activities things that i've pursued on my own mm -hmm. like pursuing soccer pursuing orchestra pursuing digital media in high school in college you know sorority learning how to deal with people learning how to um, exposing yourself to things to show that you can endure it right exactly <laughs> um that kind of thing and you know uh student government Right, and that sort of thing, and that's where I learned those lessons are priceless because you can't recreate those in types of institutions in, in class. In it, class well, room. in the real world, they're real institutions. Right. In college, it's a chance at the sort of like getting your footing through Model UN for the most part. Now, there's still decisions that are made and consequences that happen as a result of those governing, like a student government right. or a sorority. But you, it gives you this like uh, frame of reference for an experience through like wisdom because you've you've gone through that simulation before. Right, You know, exactly. this is what happened last time. Maybe I'll take a, a different approach. Yeah. And it's funny, I consider myself not an expert because I don't have a degree in it or I'm not, I've not worked in it a long time, but I know a lot about public relations, about PR. And that is strictly because of no class I've ever taken in college, but because of my work as the chief of staff for the Student Government Association. What, I mean, what better preparation could you get exactly. than man managing someone's image Exactly. You know, I mean, that's in crisis. What cut better training in like crisis management could you get? Exactly. And so I and, and manipulation and psychological terrorism. Right, right. Exactly. And there was no um, that wasn't a requirement for my degree. I did it because I wanted to. Right. You were interested it. in that. I was interested. Which is really what the design of the educational system should be. Yeah. Um, exactly. You know, it's funny, like, you know, it would be much better for the focus was skill acquisition. And it was, you know, as needed as you go through your career. Mm -hmm. Like you were a lifelong Ball State Cardinal. And they offered whatever course you needed. You could enroll it at any time, 
at any location, even online, acquire those skills, point to the credential you need to step up or right. do whatever you're trying to do. And the way our school works is, you know, it's you've got your gen eds, your required classes, which how a lot of schools are. But almost every, except for like Brown. But the thi- right, but the the terrible part is is that I'm going to my junior year and I've spent the last two years of college not eighty percent gen eds, twenty percent things about my degree. Right. And because I've now had about forty percent of my degree, my past degree done, it it took me to get to the forty percent to realize I don't want to do this. Whereas if it if it were flipped, you know, twenty eighty or whatever, maybe even sixty forty. Or you would just have the ability to ac- access them before having to check off uh, the pre the, the prereq exactly in order to get in. And I would have ha- I would have you'd be able to eliminate the things you don't like. Saved so much time and money. Mm-hmm. A year and a half ago. Absolutely. Instead of two years later. Absolutely. Which just is frustrating. And and that's why most people drop out, is they exactly. say they actually never get to the courses where they see the point. Exactly. And it's so frustrating, and I've got it off easy because, you know, you hear of the super seniors who are there for six, seven, eight years undergrad. Because the journey they keep of changing, self-discovery. <laughs> right, because they keep changing their major. I had a class, um, uh, entry-level Spanish class that I had to take, or was it? Yeah, Spanish, because the girl was like, I was a mu- music major for like four years from my whole year and then my last semester I was like I love Spanish and she's got to do it all again boy how does she like being a, a barista right uh, exactly I bet she makes the best lattes I know I think and they, then says but that's just mucho bueno right but you know what I mean like that's just awful <laughs> oh yeah that's that the, the worst part because then you the debt is the is a it's lifelong crippling. indentured it's servitude it's literally crippling it's, it is it, it really is a big reason why we don't have a lot of expansion in the economy. People it's don't take drives all of it. They don't take economic risks at an age when they can afford to take those risks because they can't you know, anymore. Cat Cat is at twenty, and us at thirty three and thirty one can take risks that uh, you know somebody who in their fifties won't because we don't. We have a long time before we retire. You can make it back up, right? And so we can we can afford to be entrepreneurial. But if you've got a five hundred dollar a month student loan payment, you're not going to take that risk, you've right? Gotta, it's it's you, cannibalized entrepreneurship right. rates for young people. Absolutely, and that's, even with the gig economy that's arisen, where everything's contract work, which yep. is technically entrepreneurship, it's still the rates are declining, which you would think wouldn't be possible. Yeah. So and, and so I think the other reason that a lot of people just don't trust, quote unquote, intellectuals and the institutions of higher learning is they just don't have a great track record. That's the thing, and that's what's really driven it. Is like you look at like. Um, you know that's the th- one in the in the show notes. If you don't mind, if I look at these real quick, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very them, but one of, one of the like things the- I wanted to talk about was even the hard sciences have become politicized. Sure. Then that is what has, in my opinion, been the primary driver of this rise for Republicans is climate change. Right. I think more so than anything else, science became politicized. Hard science did because of environmentalism, and it started actually. Most people don't realize, or you know, most people just don't remember is it started all the way back in 1972 with a group called the Club of Rome, which was like the original Al Gore. Mm -hmm. And the Club of Rome, uh, 40 years ago, published a book called The Limits of Growth, and it was a report. And in it, it was just hate. Like, everyone thought, oh, look at these new age, these people that are looking into the future and this huge threat that we pose as economic growth and the countries develop and Mm -hmm. the population gets out of control. And all the change we're going to see, we need to start planning ahead and anticipate the limits of gr- human, you know, of our resources, given humanity's population growth, and so what they forecasted ended up being a bunch of awful predictions on things such as accelerating industrial development, how much would happen, um, and at what rate, the uh, population growth, widespread malnutrition, out of the worry that we know what we're producing today in our out, our capacity now, apply it to nine billion people. Sure. You know, and so there are these this just hysteria and worry about these from these global p- central planners. It's 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 a lot of doomsday. It usually takes place because they they look at the current situation and they project it, and then they look at the current output, and they never expect humankind to be more uh, entrepreneurial or more scientific, and and the future generations will never produce more abundance. And there's no way to ever account in any model ever about mm. the technological innovation that happens in your ability to efficiently use resources. Absolutely. And that's what happens every time. That's what that's actually to tie it all back is what really got me about the title of the article was peak anti intellectual Republicans reach peak anti intellectualism. Well peak oil was the trendiest thing for all of the two thousands. Mm-hmm. This enormous worry that the appetite for oil and China's development, India's development, 
you know, all of the BRIC countries becoming first world countries through stable political institutions, that there was going to be another energy crisis, which is actually what the worry of, for the Club of Rome was. Right. And you can make a really compelling argument. It's what cost Jimmy Carter his uh, a second term. Mm-hmm. Because Jimmy Carter bought in. He was someone that bought into all this, installed mm-hmm. solar panels on the White House roof. Right. And there, the way that um, forecasting works and the market, like Wall Street works, everything is based off of proje- projection. And so all of a sudden, once it was, looked like oil was going to be severely, li- like a, a huge demand for it, it sparked the oil crisis that really just, I mean, Jimmy Carter was doing press conferences telling people to adjust their just, um, the standard of living down. Mm-hmm. He was warning people that we need to get used to less. Mm-hmm. We need to get used to higher prices on oil. And then the oil crisis happened because you had in- political instability in the Middle East with the Iranian revolution. Mm-hmm. And then you had um, like limits on supply chains for Chevron and X, or for Exxon. And then there was this huge worry by everyone in the oil and energy markets that we need, there is going to be this constriction on supply. Mm-hmm. So there was a mass um, price increase. Well, then Jimmy Carter, being the social planner he was, decided to put a cap on the price, right? A ceiling. And so then the United, you know, you couldn't buy any more. Like, the, you know, whenever you put a cap on what you'll pay, it limits the supply. Mm-hmm. And so there was a shortage of oil. Right. And then Ronald Reagan talks, you know, comes in and starts talking about free market principles and then stability quiets down in the Middle East. But all of this started because of this Club of Rome. They released a report that told everybody to, we need to adjust to lower standards of living. And they were wrong. They were just colossally wrong on everything because the elites, the experts, the environmentalists, Al Gore, there is, they don't have any understanding of that technological progress doesn't happen like geometrically it's not a linear you know thing it is like an enormous shift all of the sudden that you just never see coming right and if you look peak oil was the thought that we had hit the absolute max supply available that would ever be available for our world and how on earth are we going to deal with that with a rapidly developing china and now you have oil prices so low that most oil, like some countries aren't even allowing oil tankers to uh, like open the spigot Mm -hmm. and unload because doing so would drive the price so low it would cause political instability in Mm. places like Saudi Arabia. So this whole idea that peak oil was the trendiest worry forever for the last 10 years, it's hilarious they chose that same title about peak anti-intellectualism because peak oil was wrong. Right. And so this is another alarmist worry about their monopoly on what is and isn't science and intellectualism being challenged. And that's what really got me. I'm not Mm anti-intelligence. I'm not anti-education. I'm anti it being considered heresy to criticize Paul Krugman. Well, that's the thing. You resources are finite and ideas are not ideas are to be discussed and there needs to be a constant flow of ideas because ideas are compounding. It's, it's the same thing as you, you the buy... The gains show up in enormous because they're exponential. It's homesteading. You buy a piece of land, and then you improve that land, and you build up a house, and then you tear down that house, and you build a new house, and then you tear that one down, and you build a better house, and then you add a barn. All of a sudden, I mean, people invent... They invent a roof. They invent, like, uh, Elon Musk in right. Solar City and, and in the, um, the uh, shingles that are all sun cells. Right. So, the, so That's the future. The mind is just this piece of dirt that is constantly expanding and constantly changing, and not just our own mind, but the mind of humanity at all of all of on, on its own. And when you have people trying to limit the boundaries of thought, then you start to force everyone to live into little thatch huts and saying, thought can never get better than this thatch hut. But don't worry, we conducted a study, and you only need $75,000 a year to achieve maximum happiness, which right. is an actual study that it sure. existed and came out last year. Right. They started adjusting it down with science. Sure. You look at something like, uh, like vitamins, for instance. Studies say that you're just making expensive pee. Well, this was just one poor, poorly done study that the media cited because they were just looking for a headline, and then all of a sudden it, it slips into a meme, and you say, yeah, I, j- I just got these new vitamins. They're really great. It makes me feel great. Oh, yeah, well, I read somewhere that it's just expensive pee, and it's not true. Like you, you, Most people are vitamin deficient in some nutrient. Everybody's bi- chemistry is different. Per- personally, I had my first winter where I wasn't, insanely depressed because I was taking vitamin D3. You know, and, well, and super male vitality. And super male vitality really helped a lot this year. But you, you take something like that where people don't 
th- they just take a news report that they sort of read on a headline. They just ha- read the headline. And they like, just, let's be clear. That's what 99% of people do. Absolutely. There's this this thing going around that uh, Matt Chandler talked about on that podcast that like this these fake news stories going around and it's just it's just like half the story is just lorem ipsilo you know it's like yeah lorem ipsum like they literally could put get that passed exactly right and and it just got these massive shares because it had a, a catchy headline link and bait people mm-hmm. don't go and read it because they don't they don't feel that they have the time or the mental resources to go and do it and 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 i just like you can't base your information based on a Huffington Post, you know, when there's so much information out there that something like vitamins do help, that taking vitamins improve so many yeah. different processes in your body, but you run into so many people who are like, well, I read it on HuffPo. And th- oh, thank th- God. Th- that's, <laughs> I, 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 we've talked a lot about this where I just think smartphones and social media, as much as we love push notifications, uh. like, a lot of this is just starting to wear down our, our um, like our brains are machines. Like right now, our brains, our social capacity is very worn down because <laughs> as as a group of friends, we have spent a lot of time together. We're the three best friends. We're the three best friends. <laughs> three best friends. We're that the word best doesn't friends. mean what you think it means. And so, <laughs> so you have to go back and you have to like, you have, it, it's like you have to let your brain lay fallow, you know, where if you are planting corn every year in the same spot, then it doesn't, it isn't as effective as if you plant plant soybeans the next year because you're using up all the nutrients. Like you, you have to continually engage your mind in new pursuits and constantly challenge things. And, and if we're not as a society challenging each other, then we get what we have now, which is just this complete breakdown of communication and, anti-intellectual thought where my intellectualism is okay but the thought of another person is evil and no one has a monopoly on what is and is not intellectualism and if you and if you go back and listen to the the break it down podcast with matt chan uh, with matt carter not matt chandler matt carter um because it it is um it's approaches this issue it it, it approaches this you know where we're talking a, a lot about this yeah well, and, and I how think it affects Christianity and you know no, your, no, your faith. No, no, we really didn't even talk about. It. We just talked about public discourse. Oh yeah, civic uh, discourse. The whole time, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for listening, Greg. And I think it's <laughs> <laughs> I downloaded it. I padded the stats. I just haven't had time to listen to it. Right, right. <laughs> no, and I think it's interesting because think about like you know before. I think the availability availability yeah there we go of news is ridiculous because if you think about it, I don't know 10, 20, 30 years ago. People only got one, maybe two newspapers delivered to them. And house. it was all from sources. Like everyone had it. It was the same source right. for the most part. There would have never been. Even now, when I see like the Ball State Daily News, when I get a copy of it, you know, two times a week, whatever, I read. I don't just read the headline. I'll, if it interests me, I'll read. You the actually whole read thing. the newspaper? I bought, yeah, I like to see what's going on. Do you yeah. really? Now a newspaper. Yeah. That's, awesome. that's a blog on paper, right? Right, right. Okay. But if you think about it, there's millions of articles online, right? Oh, yeah. And it's so lengthy and, and whatnot. And now we're trained to just read the headline and read the... We don't want full articles anymore. We want a quick... Executive fe- we summary. Want a, we want a quick list. We want a quick... And bullet pointed. Bullet point list. Yep. We want a top 10 reasons, top... Oh, my God. 10, we want a top 17 or 23 reasons why. And, you know... If the Bible had been bullet points, it, it, no other religion would exist. Exactly. Well, and now we've got... And I'm guilty of this the same way. I do the exact same thing. Because, you know, when my dad would get the newspaper, he would read the whole thing and then you'd read his whole wall street journal and, then, and that's it you know long form reading like you know walking through the steps of like you know how to think and like the and thought don't processes do that anymore. no we literally just like it's almost like we just take existing thought and then regurgitate it and yeah. like we don't ever take the time to read through a whole article and then say all right what do i think about that and that's what is my what have my experiences shown me in you know, right. in contrast to that. And critical thinking is the best part, I think, the best thing you can learn at a college campus. If you only te- look, get that from your college experience, I would contend every nickel was worth it. Yeah. and How to critically think. Exactly. Like, you know, all these awful articles and movies that we have to watch that I don't care about, but it, you have to think about it. You've got to do the fact sheet. That is, the th- you know, like, it shouldn't be, ideally you would, like, uh, did you, have you taken a history course? Yeah. So, yeah, like, see. Did you really? Was it Jewish history? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't pay attention. No, it was it was a gen ed world history class. It was it Oh, was, Western Civ? Yeah. 
You took Western City? Okay, yeah. so like it was the Epic of Gilgamesh and like mm-hmm. the Sumerian culture and all that stuff. It was uh, it was an interesting class. I got a C because the first test I didn't do well on. You know, it was like four tests. And... Oh, it's usually all writing. Uh, yeah, it was all multiple choice. That's a shame. It was a shame. It was because that's really hard. I mean, it was garbage. most people have never even heard of like you know Akkadian culture or like you know Sumerian culture or like it, any of that. It like was the, called the origins of Mesopotamia and that kind of stuff. Oh, we didn't learn about. It was called. Maybe it wasn't West. It was like history of the world or something. But it was from the seventeen seventy six July fourth on. No, 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 right. That's the, the only real history when history started. <laughs> no, we started in um, like the ancient Roman, the first colleges ever. Oh, okay, ancient like the Rome. first Senate, yeah, the first like chambers. Right, and then Romulus and Remus. Did you know go back that far? We didn't no? learn about people really. It was just okay. the ideas of it, I guess. And then we ended with. Um, like Cato the and, and British, Seneca. And no, it was the, about modernization. So, like, about the first department stores in Great Britain. Oh, industrialization and, and like, commerce. That kind of stuff, yeah. And the first, uh, the, the Industrial Who Revolution. Learned all about the Who. Well, did you really? Yeah, because our professor, that was their, her favorite band. Like, counter- countercultural stuff? Yeah. So, it was, it was an interesting class, but we didn't, you know, dive too deep into anything. But it gave us a broad. And you got to see in that, huh? Yeah, I'll tell you the story off there. It was very funny. It's very funny. Called your professor got fake history. I got to see. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was before. It was before Donald Trump was really, because it was in twenty. The dark ages. I guess it was r- January of twenty sixteen. Okay. So it was before Where he denounced and really become a player. Yeah. I gotcha. Um, no, no, it wasn't. I think it was like probably November of twenty fifteen, maybe. I don't know. Hmm. No, I don't know how old I am. I mean, does it worry? <laughs> I don't. I don't think society's become anti though knowledge. Do you? No, there's more knowledge now than ever before. For sure. I think we are... Access. We are... Like, people have, you know, the joke, they have selective hearing. I mm-hmm. think we have selective learning. I think people are, people are smaller, smarter, and more knowledgeable about everything than ever before. Mm-hmm. Do you think so? I do. Yes, but I think we're lazier than ever before, and that's going hand in hand. So we're not learning, you know, because... Well, that, I mean, our, literally, our brain networks, like our neural networks have changed to the point long-form readings way less uh, mentally than it was for our parents. So hard to do it. Oh, yeah, it's just the way our brains have adjusted and and changed Mm -hmm. the actual neural pathways and, like, uh, dopamine reaction, that kind of thing. Like, it's just, you're going to see long-form reading be uh, Latin. Like, you know, it'd be like someone speaking Latin. It's honestly the reason I'm thinking about getting a flip phone, just so I can go back to reading, because it's so impossible now. Yeah. Because, I mean, you were somebody that could knock out 50 pages... Easily, easy, and I can't. I can't read more than three before I want to check my phone. Uh, my messages in chat get rejected by most people and, sc- and scanned over. <laughs> TLDR, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the lens TRLD or uh. TLDR phenomenon. The fact that on blogs and on in chat we're starting to do the TLDR thing is sad. The fact that our the quickest, most just like the easiest way to communicate now is too long. Texting is too hard. Mm-hmm. Texting, texting it's got to be shorthand text. It's got to be shorthand. Or, or it's got to be sending or a visual. Meme. Or we now that's communication, though, because our like the people that can long form read don't know how to. They can't digest anything from the visual like form of communication, like memes. Right. So and like there is that argument to make as well. Right, and I think we're split more than ever. We've got the people who can long form read mm-hmm. and long form communicate. And we've got the people who are quick. Yeah, absolutely. You know I mean? Like someone who can really analyze and draw out the important points extremely quickly because that's the world we're living in. Like, exactly. and, and the, it's necessary. Yeah. Your ability to process and analyze information and the speed at which you do it while, you know, while um, being sure to make sure that, you know, accuracy is above all most important, but the ability you're able to do it accurately, it really drives your market value, you know, in what you can earn, your potential. Right. It really does. And that's that's tough because people aren't used to the quick, deadlines and turnaround mm-hmm. times and the millennials can do things a lot quicker because they they have the technical chops to pull it off yeah right well let's start wrapping up here um what well, do you i mean you don't you, do you think it's a worry anti the peak anti-intellectualism no because everything's cyclical and everything will swing back like it's the world the world is never going to stop coming up with ideas and discussing it that's the foundation of human nature like there there's People want to sit and create false problems because it's so easy to sit here and say, it, really what it comes down to is Salon is trying to shame 
the right. You know, like you guys just ignore us, and therefore you're all dummies. Socially it, toxic it's, to it's even a, identify as a Republican. It's a social shame that they're trying to manipulate people into believing the way that they believe, and that I find reprehensible. There's plenty of uh, intellectualism on all sides. And I genuinely kind of think that this, oh, all these sides aren't listening to each other. There's some of that that is true, but also I think it's uh, we just are creating so many different headlines and narratives and then driving those narratives home to the point that they are now our truth when they may not actually be what's happening. Right. And I think that this is one of those things where it, it, it's – it's not that people on the right are anti-intellectual. It's that they're just tired of having leftist things shoved down their throat. Like, right, groupthink for the most part. Right, yeah. with no accurate, accurate uh, track record of accuracy to point to and say, "Listen, these are the doc. Or this is the right way of thinking about." These this. are the documents. Like, yeah, show you're, it. You're going to. You're I've got the bring compressed the, data. Bring out the birth certificates. Yeah. You have. You have to realize that f humans always gravitate towards freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that if you're trying to push an ideology that limits human freedom, people are going to push back on that. And it's not them that has the problem. It's you, the control freak, that has the problem. You know, people who are controlling, whether it's through government or through personal relationships, those are the people that have the problem, not the people who want to be free. You know, it, it, and so when I look at someone who is writing about how we are losing faith in institutions like higher education, I say, well, I'm – for the fundamental questioning of why. Why anything That's exists. the most patriotic behavior there is. In Absolutely. Right. Why should I listen to these people? Why should I pay attention to what they have to say? Why should Kat have to sit in a class and be lectured to? You know, and and I'm not the type of person who says that's not right. They shouldn't do that. They they can do whatever they want. It's Kat's choice. She has the choice as a human being, as an adult, to say I'm going to participate in this activity or not. You know, and Republicans and conservatives do the same thing where they try to, I instead of just getting up and walking away because they fundamentally question the premise, they try to pick a fight instead of college boy. Instead of mm -hmm. you and your science <laughs> schmines. Instead of negating the power by just standing up and walking away, you know, and yeah, they'll be left to their little silos. But if you don't believe in it, don't send your kids to it. Don't pay for it. They're, Go to that, send them to Hillsdale. Yeah, send them to Hillsdale or, you know. I, I do worry, though. One thing I don't love is, like, you know how, like, there's been uh, – technology's made democratization, like, everywhere. So, like, uh, you can get news from anywhere. Like, anyone can be a news creator. The You know, it's the democratization of every industry. You no longer control your brand. Your, your customers do. Right. You know, it's that the consumer has the power. Mm -hmm. And I think I, that is concerning because there has been this shift in that – it isn't the expert who is it ever an expert. It's the ignorant individual. There's been a, a, like a tidal shift toward uh, because of this democratization effect where everyone is an expert. Yeah. And then feels entitled to be one. I don't right. care that they have a PhD in astro, you know, physics. I've, I got on Wikipedia last night. Like, my opinion should count just as much. Right. Right. You and know, I, and I, I, that does worry me because that, that's the rejection of expertise and, like, what, you know, aspiration to knowledge. And that goes back to, you know, yes, I have a PhD in astro whatever, but uh, think of what they're taught and how they're taught. Like I've, like I've shared is just sitting down memorizing things. Right. I can sit down. I can buy their textbook. I can memorize things and teach it myself. Mm -hmm. Or I can look on the Wikipedia page where somebody has done that and made it easier yeah, for me to understand. Yeah, the acquisition of knowledge. Then you just really run into a signaling problem was how do you how do you separate who actually has gone on Wikipedia and has internalized that knowledge and who right. hasn't. Like that's the real thing in education that's missing is this the right signaling mechanism rather than the degree. Right. But I it's just if until that exists the tide has shifted to where like crowdsourcing it's similar to that like where people think crowdsourcing you know, what the crowd decides is better than what any individual decides. And, like, right. democracy is the safer bet, but it's not necessarily the best outcome. Because, like, democracy gives you Justin Bieber. <laughs> right. Expertise gives you, you know, Chopin and Beethoven. To the Swift. It, oh, that's democracy at work. <laughs> See why I'm so anti-democracy. It's <laughs> right. the god that has failed. <laughs> right. <laughs> Taylor Swift. You're about to push her out of a helicopter, aren't you? Whew. Anyways. All of a sudden, I'm feeling very Chilean. <laughs> 
uncomfortable show. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, that's the thing, though, is like, you wouldn't go buy classical music or download classical music, even though that's considered the most elite performing artists there are by the people that know. Yeah. Because but you'd go buy what you buy and read fan fiction about and conspiracy theories and. Don't share it online. I heard Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> what was the? Did you go underwater? Don't, <laughs> uh, don't share it. Are you underwater? <laughs> <laughs> oh, our friend Hannah. <laughs> uh, I got exposed to Hannah last night. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Bittner. Poor cat. There's a lot. Oh, man. Cat was sitting next to me, ch- chose to go sit by her sister, sat next to her sister. Her sister walked away from cat. Mm-hmm. And, then, and let me tell you, when the choice is Chloe. You're facing poor choices. And then <laughs> and then Bittner sat down, and she got stuck sitting next to Bittner last night. I, I got it. It was like that movie Dinner for Schmucks. <laughs> My name is Kat Anagnos, and I approve of Bittner. Oh, let's see. Physically removed. Because we're the three best friends. We're the three best friends. This has been our show. Don't, da, 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 da. don't react. You don't want Scat Cat to, to come here. Place. Scat Cat is pretty fun. Have you heard about Scat Cat? <laughs> so a new uh, segment we're doing on We Are Libertarians <sighs> is called Scat Cat. Uh, Spangle is a time. Yeah, uh, yeah. let me zoom in on you, so make sure you <clears> see <throat> this on the YouTube channel. All right, scat cat. Greg, give me a beat. Mm-ch, Countdown. Mm-ch, like mm-ch. a five, six. Oh, five, four. No. Oh, God. He's not musical. Five, six, seven, eight. Beep, bop, scally, dap, do, ba, da, da, ba, dee, ba, ba, da, boop, 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 ba, dee, beep, ba, da, ba, ba, da, da, ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba, skiddly, dap, do, ba, ba, da, ba, dee, ba, yeah. Anyway, so, as we were saying, dear What was that called? Scat cat. Thank you, thank you. There's a lot to take in. Hey, I'm the pop star of Liberty. I have to have some kind of thing to keep my name. What was that? You have a nickname? Pop star of Liberty. Are nicknames self-appointed usually? Uh, Spangle gave it to me, right? Yeah. Hmm. Hope it works out. <laughs> Anyways, thanks <laughs> for listening to Real Libertarians. We promise to do better next time. <laughs> oh, we have a whole other segment. If you'd read the show notes, you'd probably be aware. Uh, uh, she's ready to leave. Yeah, she's ready to wrap she's up. Done. We can wrap up. No. She's it's had enough. I don't want to deprive thing. the pe- I know, it's because I'm in a college class. No, and it's the Don Trump Jr. email scandal. So there's not it. much to talk about other than oh, let's talk about it. what well, smoke what smoke, me. and what's fire. Educate me because I didn't want a long form read. You yeah. don't care that Russians hacked the United States election? No. No, long story short, this Russian woman, who was she? So she is. Te- she was positioned as an attorney for the Russian government. Okay. Turns out she's also a movie maker who's been presenting and trying to raise funds for a movie about human trafficking that ties um, donations to the Clinton Global Initiative with an ease of restriction on a thing called the McGinsky Law or mm-hmm. something like that. And so she actually met with uh, Donald Trump Jr. You know, under the premise of that this was a discussion about dirt they had when it was all, she never mentioned the fact that she also had a movie that would be coming out. Yikes. And it was starring this pop star that did the connection. <laughs> Me. The <laughs> cat a... literally is a Russian hacker. <laughs> she is... Beep, bop, dilly, dap, dap, ba, dap. She's fake news. And you <laughs> claim me of not having any mus- musical ability. He just Skip offended bop, Skat Cat. Listen, I like Skat Cat. I think a it's funny. dap, doop, dap, dappity, dap. Yeah. Skat Cat I literally Skat feel Cat. like I'm living our... <laughs> Or like Reddit cringe right now. Good. Like all time setting top result. Hey, all all press is good press. <laughs> Just ask Trump. That's very true. God Emperor, mm-hmm. he does know. He has that is the one person. A beep ba doodly do. So this woman basically sends an email, gets gets a hold of Trump and said after <laughs> after trying to positioning said dirt for Hillary. Yeah, saying, I've got dirt on Hillary Clinton that you're going to want to see. And then she's like, I have dirt on Trump. So she had already positioned and reached out to the Clinton campaign for the allegations of dirt. Basically wants to lobby for a change in this law mm-hmm. in American policy. And ease of restrictions on human trafficking. Bribes the two cam- – base doesn't bribe, but basically lies to the two campaigns mm-hmm. to get a meeting. Paul Manafort – Snuffs this out and Dump is like, this is absurd. Leaves it within 10 minutes. Uh, Doesn't even read the final message in the email, Jim. Uh, no, 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 no. Manafort stayed but was on his phone the whole time. Yeah. Donald Can't Trump, imagine what that's like. Yeah, Donald Trump Jr. He probably needed it to make sure his selfie was good. Yeah. yeah. Checking in the T-Swift tumblers. Mm. Paul Manafort's on Taylor Swift tumblers <laughs> in the middle of a presidential campaign. Would have been more productive than <laughs> sitting through this said meeting. Yes, and then Donald Trump Jr. paid attention, and then uh, the son-in-law, Jared Kushner, yes. stayed for 10 minutes and left. And it, and it became clear that they did, she didn't have anything. She just lied to get the meeting. And so, the, you know, uh, here's, here's my final thoughts on it. 
let's just get right down to brass tacks. I managed a political party for three for four years. From 2008 to 2012, I was the head of the Libertarian Party of Indiana. I was the executive director. I was a paid professional political operative. I worked with my peers in the other two parties. I worked with uh, – before that for four years, working with political operatives on a news talk station. There isn't a political operative in any party ever that wouldn't have taken this meeting. Plain and simple, and if they say otherwise, they're lying. Because when you're in a campaign, you're going to take the meeting. Now, I will say this. As a libertarian, I had secret information that tens of people may have been mildly interested in. And I never <laughs> put it into text messages or emails. Because you never know what could happen to that. It's There's written records of it. You just don't do it. So you pick up the phone and you call or you meet in person and you have those conversations. What Donald, what Donald Trump Jr. emailed was so dumb that I can't even stand it. But it was the action of an amateur, not a malicious intent. Exactly right. It's just amateur, and that's what we've come to expect from them. But there's nothing here that is, that you know, yes, the, it shows that there's intent for them to collude with the Russians. You could say that. If you or, assume she is an actual representative of the Russian government, even though her entire Facebook page is nothing but anti-Trump stuff. Right. Mm. So it, it is a meeting that any political operative of any party in any campaign would have taken had they said, I've got damaging information on your uh, opponent. Would you like to meet about it? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, he just did it, and most um, would immediately know to do it off the record or do it in a you know, way that can never be confirmed. And Right. The th they're criticizing somebody for transparency, which is a rarity for the Trump campaign. But he, he ended up not, well, why didn't they cover their tracks? Because there's nothing here. This right, person's and a fraud. The allegation, it com everything comes down to this, is that it would be a tree, you know, there's a law, the interpretation of the law is that no foreign, uh, or no foreign individual can provide, um, provide an asset of material gain to a political party or else that, you know, with mm -hmm. the, the idea of influencing it. And the thing that's based off of that law is about m financial contributions. Right. It's never been interpreted as intelligence. And so they're trying to make the argument that the acquisition of intelligence, opposition research, is something of value, value, mm -hmm. which even though I think that's probably a very fair argument to make, that was never what the law was intended to be used for. And right. so collusion isn't even a treasonous act. That isn't a, an actual criminal act. Collusion isn't. So you hear collusion, that's the narrative, and that was intentionally selected to uh, propagate this narrative that collusion is something you can be tried for when it is not. It's not mm -hmm. a legally defined thing. Conspiracy is, coordination are, but not collusion. Right. And so ultimately this is all, to quote uh, Van Jones, a big nothing burger. Yep. That's it. That's the end of that segment. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. Scap ba 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 no, no, no. Keck. Uh, Dancing Frog. He's got the uh, top hat and the little cane. And he sings, hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 1920s, like, show tunes. Michigan J. Frog. Send me a work of uh, baby. My heart's on fire. Yeah. Awesome. So, pick which one you want. I have. Frog? That, that's this forced binary. Do you want binary? frog cat? Like, this is the Dancing tyranny of the frog binary. Cat, frog cat thing? Or, um, Are you telling me that the, it's A or B? Mm-hmm. I'll let you decide. I'll be bop, hello, muddy, da, be, de, da, da. I'm not judging. I don't judge others. That's something I mix I've, the two for together, a long time in say? my life. I've never judged others, and I won't judge Scat Cat since it makes you so happy. Thank you. Final thoughts for this episode, Cat. Um, very interesting. Very enlightening. Good discussion. Great discussion. We are not anti-intellectualism no. in the way it's right, cr should be correctly defined. Mm -hmm. In the way the left defines it, we're anti because yes, they've been shown they've been disproven. The truth is, they're still polar bears. Of, and right now, if Al Gore were right, we'd be underwater. Yep. Yeah. I am, I don't know. I think that college, I've enjoyed college. However, I've not enjoyed all of it. And I think that the education system needs a lot of work. And I think college, because of, like we said, the friends you make and the extracurricular and the skills you learn and the mature 
being the non curriculum stuff, stuff is great. I think the curriculum defi- definitely needs work. Yeah, and that the day's coming where you know there's going to be, be an enormous kind of upheaval. Yeah. You're already yep. seeing it with the like these uh, the radically intense uh, schools like startup school and the, the code school. You know the Khan Academy. You're going to see it where something replaces the degree as the mechanism for determining this person's really got the credentials. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's when it'll all change. Although the edu- you know the educational industrial pro- complex is even arguably worse than the military industrial complex yeah student loan debt dwarfs every other kind of debt there is and it's federally guaranteed and in-house so if that bubble pops you're talking about research um jobs communities just complete like bloomington indiana would collapse that indiana university yeah so you take away federal grant money Muncie, indiana collapse yeah i mean it, it the the educational industrial complex is enormous yeah mm-hmm. And so that's change will be damning because of the societal upheaval it would the effect it would have. Mm-hmm. But you'll see the market adapt and people will choose these schools and the places to acquire skills as soon as they can justify the money spent on the uh, credential being accepted with the same equal um, weight as a, a university. Mm. Very good. Cat, anything else? Yeah. Beep bop, skiddly dap, doobity dap, yeah. That Greg, was it. final thoughts, Greg. <laughs> this is great. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm hugging Greg for those who can't see. Oh my god, Scott, Scott! Oh sure my god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, good episode. Mm-hmm. Um, not a traditional one, but I think a good one. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so glad you did uh, the bad. I'm so glad you're not a good Christian. I can't I just can't stress that yeah, enough. I and I hope the new uh, newly acquired listeners enjoyed uh, the show. All yes. right. We're happy well, to have you. Happy to have you guys. Uh, my final thought is I want to thank Craig DeCosta. He's the one who sent that mystery microphone from last episode. Thank Aww, you, Craig. Thank you so much. So we want to thank him for his uh, gracious donation to We Are Libertarians. You can always donate to help keep us going. As you know, we grow. The more we grow, the, the more expensive this becomes to run and the more stuff that we want to do. So we always need your help. So please donate at wearelibertarians.com. And please be sure to share uh, this with your friends and family. Like, literally, if nothing else, if you can't donate or if you don't want to embarrass yourself, at least go to iTunes and write a review and rate us. That really helps us uh, in in terms of convincing people to download the show and also making sure that we're up there in the top rankings of news and politics and also when people search libertarian. So please, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Thank you, Kat, for being here. Thank you for having me again. All right. And thank you, Greg, for... Tolerating Kat. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, Enduring <laughs> Scat Kat. Yes. <laughs> I like it, Kat. Thank you. Thank and you. I think there are many of our listeners, tens and tens of our listeners, will love it too. Exactly. It'll be all of my ten accounts. And Our sock accounts give great reviews. Cat and on iTunes. one, Cat and back, goes two. It's like, yeah, we are libertarians. Brings you all the modern, and then it's like, bring back Scat Cat. Where's Scat Cat? <laughs> oh God! I'm gonna create. This is like your radical lesbian Taylor Swift army. Exactly. My separate show should be called Scat Cat. Oh, Scat-cat. now you have a separate show. Yeah, I'm gonna have my own podcast, Scat Cat. It's just gonna be an hour long of a bop bop doodly dap boopity dap ba dap beep beep boop. You know, I've never put my foot down on something. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, we have Bittner's <laughs> Keto Podcast to talk about. Oh, my God. I'm all for it. Cat is pro Bittner. I'm pro Bittner. Well. A beep bop doodly deep beep beep deep boop boop. <laughs> when you're on the side of someone like that, how could you be wrong? We need a week away from each other. All three of us. Mm-hmm. I have no issue with you. You're one, fine. One, one more one more scat and Greg's going to walk off the show. I'm going to start. Uh, he does not like the scat play. No, mm-hmm. I don't. Uh, I don't encourage uh, improv- improvisational music. Scatting. That's you think I'm improv. The oh, there's been oh, a, this has been rehearsed. I'm re- like that's how it's being produced. <laughs> <laughs> Arguably more set. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for listening, and as always, we promise to do better next time. Yeah.